Hello, hello, hello again. It is me, Christopher Snowden. You are watching the Swift Half with Snowden. I'm sorry about the hiatus we've had recently. We intended to have uh, one of these going out a couple of weeks ago, but what with one thing or another and the, uh, the, the death of the Queen and I was away in America for a while, we haven't managed to get one in the can. So I'm delighted to say we are back today with another very special guest, as always. And uh, this week it is... Mara Glover from New Zealand, joining us from New Zealand, um, where of course there is a bit of a time difference. Uh, she is the director of the Independent Centre of Research Excellence in Indigenous Sovereignty and Smoking, based in Auckland in New Zealand. She has a um, written over a hundred studies uh, in the area of tobacco control, helping people give up smoking, harms associated with uh, tobacco use. Um, and uh, she's very involved with what's going on in New Zealand. Now, folks at home, you may well know, not know what's going on in New Zealand, but it's pretty interesting. Um, firstly, because New Zealand at one time, uh, until quite recently, in fact, banned the sale of nicotine containing e-cigarettes. And secondly, because uh, although that's a, a good measure, it seems to be working well, um, they, they're also really turning the ratchet on smoking and they plan to basically prohibit smoking possibly before anywhere else in the world. Um, is that a fair summary, Mara, of what's going on in your country at the moment? Yes, that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, although they're not calling it prohibition, uh, they're not saying they're banning it, uh, but pretty much it is prohibition by stealth. Yeah, so there's two ways I, I gather that they're going to go about this. One is an idea actually that's just been mooted in the summer here in Britain by Javid Khan, who was asked to do a review of tobacco control um, for a, a new white paper, which may or may not be coming out. There is now rumoured it might not be coming out at all, but um, his proposals were really some pretty extreme stuff. But one of them was what you guys apparently are actually going to do, which is to raise the age at which people can buy tobacco by one year every year until eventually 99-year-olds will be able to buy tobacco, but 98-year-olds won't. Um, so this is a serious proposal, I gather. Yes, it is. Uh, although I think that that particular proposal is really virtue signalling. And is there really, and it, it seems to be distracting everybody from the more serious uh, prohibition, which is reducing the nicotine in tobacco down to 0.05, actually they're not saying what, but all of the documents and lobbying that occurred beforehand was lobbying for 0.05 percent milligrams um, of nicotine per gram yield so not what's actually in there but what you're going to get how would that compare to a standard cigarette today as a you'd percentage? have to smoke 20 right so it's five percent as much nicotine as you get in the cigarette today roughly speaking yeah it's you know it's like driving a car they ban the combustible engines you know that use petrol and you go out the next morning you want to go to work and it doesn't take you anywhere okay so this is also something that's been proposed elsewhere in the world in america this idea has, has cropped up well it's cropped up now and again in various different countries but it never seems to go anywhere um partly because obviously one unintended consequence is that people will just smoke 20 times as much i guess um, but also, it's, it's fairly obviously a form of prohibition. I mean, the, the analogy I, I like to make is with actual prohibition of alcohol in America in the 1920s, um, there was you know, a small, very small beer you could buy. You could get beer at 0.5% ABV, um, but no one really called that beer because, you know, it, it, it basically wasn't, you know, you can get traces of alcohol and all sorts of things. You don't call it an alcoholic uh, product. Um, and in America, I gather it's very unlikely that this will actually happen, even though the FDA keeps talking about it and they're incredibly litigious over in America and there's all sorts of lawsuits that would at least string it out for decades, even if they try it. But you were telling me the other day when we met that Jacinda Ardern is really pretty committed to this plan. Well, her government has a majority. Uh, they have been pushing through many other uh, rapid social change laws and despite a lot of public concern, a lot of submissions saying no and, and putting opposing arguments, they're just ignoring those and ramming through whatever they want. So I, I can't see that this is going to be stopped. And 
it's already been through the select, select committee hearing process. The next thing that will happen is that it will go for a second reading and then a third reading in Parliament. They're hoping to uh, shove it through before Christmas. Really? And when would it come into force? Well, I think uh, 2024 would be the beginning of one of the first policies that's being pushed and then 25 and then 27. So I think the age one isn't going to come until 27, but by then, of course, you know, how many people are still going to be smoking cigarettes that they can buy at the store that only right. have it, you know, virtually a trace of nicotine in them. So um, I expect that a lot of people will still be smoking, but they'll have to be sourcing that on the black market, which is just out of control now. So I just realized I haven't got my microphone in the right place. Can you hear me okay? I can, yes. You can, okay, that's lucky. You can probably hear me a bit better now, can you? Hold on. Yes, I can. That should make a big difference. Um, okay, so long as people can hear me at home. But the big mic is back. I should explain to viewers at home, there is no big leather chair today. I've had a, a, a camera mishap, which means I can't film from the usual angle. Be back next time. Um, right, sorry about that. So, yeah, so I mean... What you're saying is people won't be buying cigarettes, or very few people presumably will be buying cigarettes when there's no nicotine in them. And therefore, the age of purchase thing is a, is a side issue, really. What would you expect to happen here? Is everyone going to stop smoking? Or if not, where are they going to get their cigarettes? Well, given that there is no real life scientific evidence in the world for this policy or the age ban or the other policy, which they also are going to pass, which is to reduce the number of retailers in the country from, it's about 8,000 now, uh, down to about 500 to 1,000. There's very little details about the specifics in the legislation. And uh, the, yeah, with those combined, we really, we don't know what's going to happen. There is no real life evidence. It's, it's completely unknown. We can only speculate as to the negative consequences and, and what people are going to do. And what we've seen in Australia and New Zealand in particular in recent years is, I think, I think I'm right in saying that both those countries have the highest cigarette taxes in the world. I know Australia definitely has the highest cigarette taxes in the world. And there's you know, plain packaging and you know, all, all sorts of other anti-smoking policies. And I guess the governments of those countries feel that they are so remote in a sense, geographically, uh, and New Zealand has a pretty small population, um, that it's not an obvious target market for the Chinese smugglers or what have you. But over the years, as tobacco taxes have gone up in, certainly in, in Australia, you've seen a huge increase in the illicit trade. And I think they, they, the, the customs people in Australia seized over a billion cigarettes last year. And that's just how many they seized. And who knows how many more get through, right? It's an incredible size of a, a black market, really, for a, for a country with, with that population, with relatively few smokers. And New Zealand, you didn't see that initially, but you did see a lot of robberies of, of, of shops, of dairies, as you call them. And then yes, that... Right. Yeah, tell us about that. Yes, so relative to income, New Zealand's uh, price of cigarettes is actually higher than Australia, because they earn more. So... Being an island uh, in the South Pacific, uh, our nearest neighbour is three hours by plane. And, you know, I guess a lot of the social engineer, engineers are, are really um, very, very excited. This is a perfect kind of petri dish to try out uh, weird and wonderful sort of utopian type, they think, policies. But we have had quite a lot of smuggled tobacco being uh, caught by our border control, who are very, very good. They need to be. And, you know, they've found uh, cigarettes in like wallboard, uh, all, all sorts of inside furniture. Um, I mean, there's one guy in jail at the moment, or he's, he's going to be doing five years for the amount that he bought in from China. So there is smuggled tobacco coming in. Uh, we don't know how much gets through and, as you say, how much gets caught. It certainly is not as easy as, as most of the other countries in the world where it's a short boat trip or, you know, you're, you're sharing a land border. So, again, it's going to be difficult to know. They're going to ramp up the funding to uh, our border control. They're going to increase the fines 
you know, just horrendously. And I can already see from our participants and our Voices of the 5% study from what they're saying, you know, many of them would buy black market tobacco if they knew where to get it. Whenever they go to the store, they're like, I'll have the cheapest, please, hint, hint, and hoping the shopkeeper will bring it up from underneath the counter, but no. And so the demand for the black market tobacco is much higher than, than the supply. And the robberies uh, really spiked and went through the roof. So we have a lot of young people. Uh, they tend to be mainly Māori, our Indigenous and Pacific Island youth, uh, not only youth, um, you know, some men as well, some girls, and they, the ones that are getting caught anyway, that's, that we know of. Uh, and so that, that's kind of become the new sort of initial pathway into prison for many of our uh, youth who are getting dragged in or recruited in to do these robberies. Uh, I did do two studies that got published on the topic, and that's pretty much been ignored. Um, part of that, you know, if you start having robberies at your local store, there's lots of flow on effects for the community. And it just kind of generally breaks down that um, compliance with the law. So now the youth are robbing jewellery stores, they're going into shopping malls and just smashing up. Uh, they're walking into shops. Well, a man walked into our local uh, sort of superette, picked up some cartons of beer, walked out. And the, the shopkeeper at the teller's like, hey, are you going to pay for that? And, you know, they sort of swore at her, walked out, went, came back in and got another one. So there's a, a lot of really brazen thefts going on. They're getting away with it, a lot of them. Crime pays. So we're going to see a lot more of that, I expect. Are we talking armed robberies? These yes. Are ram raiding or what kind of thing? Yes. Ram armed raiding robberies. with cars. So they're stealing yeah. cars. Uh, they're ram raiding into the front of shops if, if there's no sort of bollards. or uh, And and then they they sometimes steal three cars and they'll have them sort of set up so they switch and switch and, and switch again. So that's a flow-on effect to the community. You know, insurance rates go up. Uh, people's cars are being stolen. It, it's just the concern about the crime in New Zealand is really getting quite uh, widespread now. Uh, they're trying to blame it on youth, which is always, you know, what they do. Um, it's it's the youth and they've got nothing to do and they've got problems and the parents are failing rather than taking any responsibility for the fact that they passed policies that was going to cause this to occur. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, in that case, are, are people not putting two and two together and thinking, well, if things are like this now, just because a pack of cigarettes is how much is it? Like 30 New Zealand dollars or more? 38, 38, 38 or more for a packet of 20. Which is about, yeah. about 20 pounds, I think, roughly speaking, a lot. And we have loose tobacco as well. Among the yeah. lowest socioeconomic and the poorest people, they usually will smoke loose tobacco. But another one of the policies passed many years ago was minimum pack size. So the minimum pack size for a loose tobacco is 30 grams. That's like $75. Really? Wow. Yeah. So it, they've just priced it out of the market for the lowest uh, socioeconomic group who have the highest smoking rates yeah so are uh, people not putting two and two together and saying well if, if people are ram raiding shops and you know pointing guns in people's faces to get hold of cigarettes now because of taxes what are they going to do when you know they they effectively can't get hold of legal cigarettes at all well that's that not, yeah, like, that not part of the, the, the I mean, <laughs> no matter what the politicians think aren't, aren't the general public thinking that or are they just kind of ignoring it or, or not even paying attention the retailers certainly believe that it's because of the taxes. Uh, some public, some media kind of have put two and two together. The politicians absolutely, was, especially the incumbents, absolutely deny that. Uh, and as I said, blame it on youth. And tobacco control uh, tells the public that it's just a story made up by the tobacco industry. It's not right, true. Yes. It's not actually happening. Yeah. Yes, that's a very common, a very common line. If they just keep repeating it to themselves, this actually the tobacco industry. I guess because they, they say because a lot of the, the the tobacco that's smuggled in is legitimate, like it was originally made by the tobacco industry. That's about the only connection. But even then, a lot of it, of course, isn't. A lot of it's made 
you know, completely in the black market. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, there's those parallel ones that they've, they've got the brand of a mm. big tobacco company, but they're not, they're, you know, they're, they're counterfeit. So that, there is some of that as well. So I expect that, you know, I mean, the, the goal apparently is that everyone is to shift from smoking to vaping. So we do have regulated vaping and they expect everybody to shift to those. They already banned the oral nicotine pouches. Have uh, they? We do, yeah, in the well, vaping what, regulation. What was the basis for that? Because these things don't contain any nicotine at all. There's no evidence of any harm at all, really. So what From the, the oral nicotine pouches, yeah. yeah. Uh, they, they really want to eliminate all tobacco and all nicotine use. So the more nicotine products, risk-reduced products you have, then the more complex it gets to eventually ban them all. So everybody hates vaping. Nobody would even know if somebody was using an oral nicotine pouch necessarily. So the vape, vaping is a very good target for them to go after once they get everyone off smoking cigarettes, then it's all in the vaping regulation. It's all set up there to do exactly the same sinking lid. They've mm -hmm. licensed vaping uh, specialist vape stores and it's, it's already all in the regulations that the Minister of Health can reduce the number of vape retailers and they can put up the fees for applying to be one for your annual reporting and, and all of that until they squash that out as well. They're essentially putting the entire country into cold turkey. Yes, with the, ve with the very low, very, very low nicotine cigarettes, uh, that is what will happen. So they are, you know, expecting everyone will go to vaping. But of course, there are a lot of people who have been put off vaping by the disinformation. They, mm. They've been told, you, oh, you get popcorn lung, it's as bad for you as smoking. And, and so our anti-vaping groups, which pretty much copy everything that gets said in America, are going hard out, especially now with another amendment to the Smoke-Free Environments Act going through, they're trying to argue, put vaping in there as well, do it to vaping as well, reduce the number of vape stores. Mm. Uh, so they're not letting up at all. And uh, the legislation is written in such a way that, it is, and this is in the vaping regulation that has already been passed. It says that vaping must not be normalized. We must prevent the normalization of vaping and as you know, their term for normalization is, you know, that's a code word for the whole, you know, prohibition uh, and stigmatization of people. Um, and that's what it's all written already. That one's already passed. This is just the final kind of, okay, now, now we need to do something to tobacco so that people move to vaping. We get them all from smoking onto vaping. Then we start crunching down uh, the sinking lid on vaping products. And obviously there's a lot of public health people who are very much supportive of this and probably came up with the idea themselves. So what's, what's your background and why, why do you not quite go along with that? What seems to be a bit of a consensus in New Zealand on, on these issues? Yes, I'm, well, 30 years in, in tobacco control and public health, uh, working on the first Smoke-Free Environments Act, which, and the intention of that was to reduce uh, deaths and disease from smoking related illness so you know I still believe in that cause and I still believe we should work towards that uh, but the vaping regulation amended the intent of the original smoke-free environments act so it's no longer about reducing disease and death it's about not normalizing vaping and uh, making sure nobody who has never smoked or never vaped ever vapes making sure anybody who has vaped and has quit never, never returns to vaping. Uh, it, it, it's just, you know, I mean, at the conference in Washington, the GTNF, I put up a, a graphic of if you've played mini golf or putt-putt, and it's, you know, the smokers are at the top level, you put them down to vaping, you put them down to the bottom and down the hole. It's a one-way street. And I mean, I know you don't come at this from necessarily a libertarian angle, but there is a no sort of 
philosophical debate going on in New Zealand about, you know, the, the limits of government and, you know, at what point does something stop being the government's business? If you're, you know, using a nicotine pouch, like you say, no one can see, it doesn't affect anybody. It probably doesn't even affect you negatively. Uh, it seems to me that this is one area where you really need to start talking from first principles about basic, you know, human liberty and personal freedom. Is that not much of a conversation in New Zealand? I guess not. It, no, well, it is, but you know, in the cancel culture that we live in, if you say anything uh, against what the current government uh, and all of their supporters want, so we have a Labour government in, which uh, and, and then the Greens. So with the Greens, they can get anything across. Well, they can get it across the line on their own, but they have full support of the Greens and an agreement with them. So it's a very, uh, very left-wing, uh, social engineering, uh, they're pushing so many laws through. Uh, they're talking about a, a hate speech law. Um, and, if, you know, I don't know if you saw our prime minister speak recently, the speech she gave at the UN, or you might have heard about it, where she, she termed um, words are a weapon of war now, and we need to take usual war-like <laughs> responses to stub them out. So we have a very, very vicious uh, cancel culture if, if on, on social media or anywhere people are just attacked for spreading disinformation. And disinformation is basically anything that is opposite to what uh, our prime minister wants that's just wow. one aspect of it some of the other other laws um just i think it was yesterday they said they were going to impose what's uh hilariously called the fart tax on so farmers will have to pay for the emissions of their cows burping um and other things. So the, the farming community is incredibly, which is kind of the backbone of New Zealand. And so they're under attack, very radical. Again, it's actually the same manual. How do you get rid of a behavior you don't want? How, and so everything that tobacco control has done they're planning to do to alcohol. They're planning to do it to get people to stop driving cars. They're planning to do it to stop farmers from farming animals and creating food for us. So it's the same happening across a whole lot of different realms of society. People are reeling. They just, you know, we have a group that are fighting for free speech. We have a groundswell, which is you know, another sector of the society fighting for the rights to farm. Um, you know, it, it's, it's just like multiple, multiple laws being passed really rapidly and despite what anyone says. It sounds extraordinarily authoritarian. When's the next election? <laughs> uh, not, not until it's, it's, pegged for about October next year. And uh, there are two opposition parties who combined should be able to win that. And they already are uh, having to say, well, we, we, we will repeal this one. We're going to repeal this one. We're going to repeal this one. By the time they get in, there will be so many laws that they need to repeal. I can't see repealing the tobacco regulated Act, which is going to be pushed through. Um, that's you know there are far more drastic social change programs that they they will need to repeal first. There's kind of a scorched earth policy. It sounds like from just yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, well, they... she wants to be first in the world at everything. Well, know? that's the thing, isn't it? That's always a problem when you have politicians who want to be world leading and probably got their eye on some kind of prize from the World Health Organization or even a job from the World Health Organization. Well, that's right. A lot. Um, that's right. I mean, Helen Clark didn't quite get to the top, course, and yeah. uh, and she uh, reportedly they speak every morning. Um, and if Helen Clark is mentoring her, well, it will be well. 
you know, what did it for me was the Smoke Free Environments Act, the first in the world. You can do that too. And that can become, you know, your pathway. And maybe you will get to the top. We will get you to the top. Um, it is very authoritarian. A lot of people are very scared. A lot of people are like, you know, this is not the country I grew up in. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are leaving. It's, yeah. And, it, and among our participants who, when we recruited them, they didn't want to stop smoking and or they didn't believe they would be able to. And some of them are the, the stress, you know, it's like, oh, they're not really smoking more. They're not saying that they're smoking more. But um, when we interview them, there's a lot of uh, powerlessness, uh, an extreme, you know, sense of powerlessness. Mm, I bet. And... I mean, you're particularly concerned with the indigenous communities there where smoking rates are a lot higher. How much higher, out of interest? Uh, about 37 oh, percent. And very high. Yeah. Yes. And I think the average across the whole population, it's down to like 10.7 percent. So we still do have a two to three percent difference in, in inequity there. Mm. And the other inequity is if you look at socioeconomic the quintiles you know the socioeconomic status so you've got the you know if you look at the lowest uh, fifth of the population or with the highest pop, highest income they're already below five percent smoking prevalence right but if you look at the poorest quintile um they still have really high smoking rates proportionately yeah, I mean, thirty-seven percent is extremely high compared to five percent. Obviously, I mean, so you've got this yeah. massive difference, and of yeah. course, as as smoking becomes more and more disproportionately at the the lower end of the income scale, then it seems authoritarian becomes authoritarianism becomes much more easy to do because the people at the top like don't even know anyone who smokes. It's something that's very very distant from them. I know two of the issues where you kind of parted ways with um, other people in the anti-smoking movement was were. Um, well, just tobacco taxes in general, and also the ban on smoking in cars. Um, yeah. Tell us why they were the, the wedge issues for you. I think before that, it was the stigmatization and uh, this the smoking in cars was this was another kind of magic trick where there was a sleight of hand. So, of course, who's going to object to banning smoking in cars when when and of course they always use children are present but it's actually anybody under the age of 18 if anyone under the age of 18 is in the car and you smoke uh, and then you could be stopped by the police and fined so that's the first time that we begin to criminalize the person who smokes that they will be fined for smoking the smoke-free environments if anyone was going to be fined for people smoking in a restaurant or a bar it was going to be the proprietor so i i never ever supported that move to criminalizing individuals who are engaging in smoking don't care where they are they don't find them uh we should be why, why not out of interest because it seems to me fairer to find the person smoking in a in a in a bar if you can't smoke there rather than force the proprietor to police it well you know it's kind of like if you believe that smoking is addictive uh, that that it's dependency forming and that that's why it's so hard for people to stop uh, then we're really talking about a behavior that the health system needs to help with. They need to provide counseling, alternative products, nicotine replacement therapy. We had our national quit line, which was free to use. And, you know, so, so do that, make it easier for, for people to quit, provide support for them to quit and or to reduce smoking. But fining them, that's like, uh, are they going to start fining people who have heart, heart disease or are obese and have diabetes, you know, it's like whether you take a health approach, you see this as something the health system should help with. Instead, they want to push it over to the criminal system. Yeah, but that's what happens when you start banning things everywhere, right? That's right. That's right. The police so, are going to get involved at some stage. And why involve the police as if they haven't got enough to do? You know, we have really high domestic violence rates. You know, there are other other more important, uh, you know, even house burglaries that they don't keep on top of. And then you want to add, okay, you've now got to, you know, look in cars 
stop cars or parked cars. Mm. It also moved the Overton window in terms of police powers. So it wasn't just somebody's driving along the street or like, you know, the police might see someone on a mobile phone and they can give them a fine for doing that. The law said that they can look in a car anywhere, like anywhere a car is, that's a road. So if it's on a road, they, they can tap on the window. They can stop it while it's driving. Then they had the right to um, question everybody in the car, their name, address, age. Uh, it, it kind of was like that, you know, what they do in America where they are allowed to stop anyone, stop and frisk type yeah, things. Yeah. You know, and it really extended the powers of police to stop anybody. They could say, well, ha-. and then I knew also that the vaping regulation was next. And this is the other thing they're doing. They slice the changes up into, into single amendments. Well, why not do them at the same time? Well, then people would have realized they were going to ban vaping as well and smokeless products. So that ban on smoking in cars banned smoking, vaping, and the use of smokeless products in a vehicle when someone under 18 was present. You could have two young people in a car and they're both, say, using a heat not burn, which nobody really knows about because advertising is banned, so they can't tell anyone about that one. So let's say two are, you know, two young people are vaping and some of our young people are really big, you know. So, <laughs> you know, the police... It basically gave them the power to pull over anybody. How can you tell if there's a baby in the car? You'd have to actually stop it or tap on the window and get them to open. The only cars that were exempted uh, from that were where people were living in their car. Right. A specific exemption for that. Extraordinary. Yes. Okay, well, yes. I'm afraid our time is up and we're very strict on time on this show. But it's been absolutely tremendous uh, speaking to you. Folks at home, do follow her on Twitter. She's very easy to find. She tweets a lot and reads some of her research. It's very, very interesting. I have to say, I, I feel sorry for you in the situation you're in, but I hope the whole thing is a massive catastrophe and is seen to be a catastrophe worldwide. Otherwise, there's a very real danger of contagion. I'm sure people will be saying in Britain in a few years' time, ah, New Zealand has led the way. And now Jacinda is the head of the WHO when we should, we should uh, do what they did. So, um, no, I hope it's a, uh, well, I hope it somehow doesn't happen. But if it does happen, I hope it's a disaster. I'm sorry for you and the rest of the people in New Zealand that are going to uh, pick up the pieces from that, but uh, it needs yeah. to fail. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very so much, much indeed for joining us. Uh, thank you at home for watching. I'll be back hopefully in the leather chair or even in London, who knows, uh, in a couple of weeks' time. But we are back now every two weeks. Take care. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for to our donors. If you want to become a donor, go to the IA website and give us some cash. It'd be splendid. And see you in two weeks' time. Cheers. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IA broadcast.